Okay, so we are now officially getting started today. Um, today's program is in conjunction uh, with the exhibition Frida Kahlo, uh, Diego Rivera and Mexican Modernism, which is on view at the Albuquerque Museum through May the, May the 2nd. Um, today's program is uh, called uh, Self-Portrait es te Tejana. And this program is going to be presented to us today by James Oles. And I'm gonna give you a little introduction to James. Um, he is a specialist in Latin American art, focusing on modern um, Mexican art and architecture through museum as well as academic projects. His books include South of the Border, Mexico in the American Imagination, 1914 to 1947, and Art and Architecture in Mexico, the first survey of its kind in some 50 years, as well as books on artists as diverse as Helen Levitt, Agustin Lazo, and Pedro Friedberg. He has also published scholar scholarly essays in journals and museum catalogs on a wide variety of topics, from Neo-Mayan architecture to color photography of Manuel Alvarez Bravo, um, who is actually in our show, with a focus on the Mexican art of the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. Oles divides his time between US and Mexico. He is actually joining us from Mexico City today. Um, he is a senior lecturer in the, the art department at Wellesley College. And in 2002, he was appointed adjunct, adjunct curator of Latin American art at the Davis Museum, where he advises on exhibitions and the permanent collection. In 2019, he curated Art Latin America Against the Survey, which featured 150 works by 100 Latin American and Latinx artists in the permanent collection of the Davis Museum. He also edited a major scholarly catalog for the exhibition with contributions by 40 scholars. He is currently teaching a seminar entitled, Who Was Frida Kahlo at Wellesley? Which is a wonderful connection to today's program. As a guest curator, he has organized numerous exhibitions in Mexico and the US at the Center for Creative Photography, the Museo de Arte Moderno, Museo Carrillo Gil, uh, Museo Rufino Tamayo, Museo del Palacio de Bellas Artes, and the Museo Nacional de Arte. His current projects include a major traveling exhibition, Mexicone, Color and Photography in Mexico, the first comprehensive history of color photography in Mexico, organized by the Museo de, del Palacio de de Bellas Artes in Mexico City, and D Diego Rivera's Americas. America, organized by the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, which opens in summer of 2022 and travels to the Crystal Bridges Museum of Art. He is also the editor of a catalog um, for both of those projects. Um, so if you all will join me now in welcoming uh, James Oles. Hi, everybody. Um, I scrolled through the list uh, and of people that are here and I recognize some names. Uh, it would be much more fun if I was in the room with you all to, to greet you and, and maybe um, go out afterwards. I wanna thank uh, Elizabeth uh, and the Albuquerque Museum for this, uh, for this invitation. And um, I, I really wish I was in Albuquerque. I, I love New Mexico. I've gone many times. I, I would be spending a week there. I have uh, quite a few friends there, Chris Villa and uh, Andrew Connors, uh, the director of the museum. But unfortunately, this is all gonna be virtual. Although I know there's some people out there that wouldn't be, <laughs> wouldn't be in the audience if this was a live lecture. So um, welcome to everybody. And again, thank you for, for, the, for the invitation. I've been um, familiar with the, Jacques and Natasha Gelman collection now for, for many years. Um, uh, I uh, wrote about the collection in one of its first uh, presentations in the United States at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art back in the 1990s. So I've, I've followed these paintings um, on their peregrinations uh, for, a, for a long period of time. And so I thought today I would do a deep dive into a single picture in the collection. So Elizabeth, you go to the next slide. Um, 
and that uh, this, can you, can you do the, or, okay, great. Um, uh, this this self-portrait of 1943. And I thought, so I thought I would dig deep into it, first looking closely at it as a, as a picture on its own, and then going off in all sorts of directions to see how we can understand this painting in, in greater detail. It's one of Kahlo's iconic works, um, but there's, um, to me, uh, rather than delving into her biography, my current interests and, and what we're really doing in this seminar at Wellesley are to look at Kahlo in comparison to other artists, uh, to look at her in her context, to the cultural, political, social context in which she was working uh, at the time, uh, and to kind of explode the painting outwards rather than just kind of focus narrowly inwards on, um, on the picture, uh, on, on her biography. So this painting was acquired soon after it was finished by Jacques and Natasha Gelman in 1943, directly from the artist. They were one of Kahlo's uh, most important patrons in, in this period uh, <clears throat> and acquired a lot of works by her. Um, the, um, it was painted in the early 1940s, which was a very productive period for Frida Kahlo. She, she did many works. She was a slow painter, uh, and you can see here, and before we even get into the, to the iconography, tremendously detailed, very, very precise, working with small brushes, and it took her a long time to do these works, and she produced works at a rather slow rate. But the early 1940s were a particularly prolific period for her, partly because uh, following her remarriage to Diego Rivera in 1940, she was focused on trying to make a living as a painter herself. And so she was really dedicated, dedicated to her art in that way. The next slide. This, um, the simple title, Self-Portrait, is, I believe, original. It was exhibited as such uh, the first time it was publicly presented in 1947 in an exhibition at the Palace of Fine Arts in Mexico City, which was at that time the most important art museum in the country, in a show called uh, 45 Self-Portraits by Mexican Painters. And uh, this was the, uh, the image uh, that Kahlo selected for the show or that the curator selected for the show. The, and, uh, and it reminds us too, if you look there on the right, you can see this wavy, gilded frame and this this is kind of a bad scan but it it's still in the original frame today next the subsequent titles that it has been better known as um self-portrait as a tawana and i'll get into that word in a minute or diego on my mind or thinking of diego those two latter titles both reference the fact that a self-portrait of Diego Rivera appears just above Kahlo's eyebrows on her forehead. Um, those titles, I believe, are all later, um, assigned probably all after Kahlo's death in 1954, in order to distinguish this particular self-portrait from so many of her other self-portraits, including four others in the Gelman collection. So I don't think Kahlo put these kind of more personal, even, even, even the Diego on my mind, which seems to be a uh, first person title, I think they're all placed later uh, and then uh, by, by, by art historians or curators, or even perhaps um, by the Gelmans. Uh, next. Um, Kahlo is dressed in a very particular garment here, which for all of its seemingly strange or even one could even say almost surrealist properties is real. And it's in fact represented with almost um, photorealist accuracy. It's the upper half of a ceremonial garment worn with a long skirt or a nagua. And I'm showing on the right side, a page from a 1899, um, illustrated magazine in Mexico that shows three variations uh, of ways of wearing this, this garment. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, 
that is typical of the Isthmus of Tehuantepec in the southern part of the state of Oaxaca. Um, the skirt can vary um, and the way that this costume is, this way this headdress is worn can also vary as you can see in those three photographs. Sometimes the skirt is very tight and wrapped uh, around the waist. In those cases, uh, the skirt is, is actually more associated with the indigenous cultures of the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. And those skirts are richly dyed in blue um, and purple using both indigo and a particular snail that's found on the Pacific coast. That type of skirt uh, or inagua is almost completely vanished. And even at the time Kala was working was, was very rare. Far more common was the skirt you see the woman in the middle wearing, it's probably the same model, uh, which uh, has um, fabric going down about to the length of the knee and then a, uh, a length of lace, of white lace has been sewn to the skirt uh, that hangs down and it kind of imitates the appearance of a white petticoat beneath a colored skirt, but it is actually one single, one single skirt with just two types of fabric. And that broader skirt, that more flowing skirt is what Kahlo always wore with this, with this type of uh, upper part, which I'll, I'll go, go into a little bit more detail in a minute. She never wore that uh, skirt that was tight to, to, the, to the legs, partly uh, because it was uh, far rarer in, in, by the 1940s, but also because it wouldn't have allowed her very much freedom of movement. Um, so uh, you can also see, and I'm gonna come back to this, that in this 19th century, this 1899 series of photographs on the right side, you can see that this um, uh, wipil, which I'll be talking about in a, in a minute, the, the, upper part, the upper part of the garment, can either be worn in such a way that part of it frames the face or it can be sort of reversed and the lower part, which in Kahlo's case kind of comes down across her torso, this wide part that comes across the torso, can actually be worn and draped around the head, which is what you see uh, on, the, on the photograph on the right side. So this skirt, this uh, headdress element, this kind of upper part of the, of the costume can be worn in two very different ways, which I'll come back to a little bit later. Um, next. Now this is this this garment is something that Kahlo actually owned, and here it is uh, on the uh, in the center there, the exact same object. Photographs of her wearing this garment were known. This is one by uh, Bernard Silverstein from around 1940, in which she's wearing one of these flowing skirts again with the lace sewn, this kind of lace border sewn to the bottom. Uh, but in in 2004, when uh, these rooms were opened up in the Frida Kahlo Museum, rooms that had been sealed up for 50 years uh, since Diego Rivera's death. Um, all of Kahlo's clothing that had been preserved there was unpacked and restored. And this, um, this garment was discovered at that time. And you can see that Kahlo has represented it, as I said, with almost a photographic um, quality imitating this sort of floral design of the lace uh, 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 kind of that covers the neck and that beige quality and capturing the whites and purples and all the details are rendered with, with really almost an anthropological degree of accuracy. As anthropologist Marta Turok uh, noted in her study of Kahlo's costumes, um, this garment with this zigzagging oval that surrounds the face is known um, can we go to the next one, please, uh, Elizabeth? Is known as a um, bidani kichi uh, or great wipil or face wipil. Wipil is a generic word used in much of Mexico for the blouses that women wear. Um, and wipils can take many, many different forms. They can be different lengths. This is a type of wipil, a very distinctive type of wipil. Um, and it, it's, it's, this one is very specific to the town of Cuchitan on the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. They're still manufactured today, as you can see in the photograph on the right, this recent photograph, though rarely today do the, um, do the women in Tehuantepec have access 
to the fine Belgian lace that was often used in the 19th and early 20th century uh, to make these. In, uh, the Badani Kichi is, is, a, is a, a, local, a local term, but they're sometimes also called resplandores, a word that in Spanish brings up such ideas as radiation or resplendence or even a flame-like blaze uh, to refer to that energized white frame uh, around, around the face. What's interesting is that this uh, the origins of this garment are not known. We have early 19th century images of it, so we know it's been around at least since the time of Mexican independence. Um, but its actual source, it's very different from any other garments, uh, regional garments in Mexico, and its actual origins are unknown. There are many theories that float around. If you look in the front part of the Kahlo painting, you can see a sort of a sleeve-like element that, uh, that comes down right, right in the center, kind of on a, on a diagonal. And that is, it's like a little sleeve, a little useless sleeve um, that, uh, that, um, that pops down there, there in the front. Um, I see this yellow thing is just coming in and out, isn't it, Elizabeth? Um, please move this window away from the shared application, but you've been unable to, I'm sorry, I just. Uh, I can try a few things if you wanna give me a moment. Um, I haven't been lucky with getting it gone, but let's see if this, Nope, that doesn't do it. Uh, so let me stop the share one more time and we can get back to this and let's see if we can get rid of it. Usually means there's more than one application open. So let me try one more time. I could also share it probably from my end. Do you wanna try? Yeah, let's see if that works for you. Um, and let me make you a co-host. That's how I have to. So folks just have a few minutes of patience so we can see if we can figure it out. Sometimes, uh, you know, um, Zoom has its, uh, you know, it, it has its problems. Okay, so you should be okay to share. And it looks like it looks great on your end. <laughs> Okay. No boxes. <laughs> All right. So everybody, sorry for that. Um, but now we have none, at least, is everybody seeing it fine, I guess? Everybody. Okay. Can okay. Okay. Um, all right. So I just want to go back here and say that now you can see my little cursor, I think, too. Uh, but um, this little sleeve element really makes no sense in, in any of the ways that this costume is worn. There's no way that you could actually ever put an arm in that sleeve. So there are many theories about the origin of this dress, that it was um, that the Zapotec women of the Isthmus of Tehuantepec in the colonial period had, got access to some priestly garments or maybe some children's christening dresses or something, and they weren't quite sure how to wear them and they, kind of just tried to pull it over their heads and, and kind of invented a dress. There are many, many theories, but none have ever been confirmed because in the early, in the colonial period, when this costume was first invented, it's not an indigenous costume, it's really something that comes in the colonial period, there was no record made, no traveler noted it as far as we know. So its origins are a little bit, uh, a little bit in the world of, of myth, its specific origins. I mentioned that Kahlo has presented this costume with, with an off, a, a, almost photorealist uh, attempt to, uh, to render every stitch, every, every detail um, as, as the garment actually was. And yet, of course, this painting wouldn't be called photorealistic in any way. Not only is that uh, head of Diego Rivera on Kahlo's forehead, uh, unexpected, but there are these white threads that lead off from the lace around her face off to each, uh, uh, to the margins of the painting. And they are joined by these little dark 
uh, root-like tendrils that emerge, really they all flow out from the flowers and leaves in this uh, arrangement at the top of her head. And that of course um, is completely imagined. And I would say that we might at least think of this energized field of tendrils and threads surrounding Kahlo's face uh, in conjunction with the brushwork around any of Van Gogh's portraits from the late 1880s um, in which the, the, this energy field kind of um, uh, increases our fascination with the psychology of the subject, even though Kahlo's uh, gaze is so stoic, very much like Van Gogh's. Um, it's, that, it's that energy field around her, not only the costume, but these tendrils and threads that really make the painting so fascinating. Next, oh, no, now it's me, sorry. So Kahlo actually owned two of these uh, expensive ceremonial garments. And I should say that at the time that Kahlo acquired them, they were expensive. They were um, not, they, they were used really only for ceremonial purposes. This one, uh, which appears in a portrait of five years later, has a slightly different pleat around the edge. I mean, it's, I, I didn't really see how here it gets really pointy and here it, the, the pleats create a more continuous oval form. And this type of garment, uh, which Kahlo also owned, um, is typical of the town of Tehuantepec, which is just a, about an hour or so away from Huchitan. It's unclear whether Kahlo placed any importance or even knew about the differences between the way that this ceremonial wipio or bidani kichi um, was, was manufactured in Huchitan and Tehuantepec, although those towns are competitors today, economic and political competitors uh, on the isthmus. But she would, we have to remember that Kahlo was working from the distance of Mexico City and that she herself never visited the region. Um, and perhaps for her, both of these costumes, although anthropologists today see them as very different, for her might have been both kind of blended into this single unitary culture of the Tawana, the woman from Tehuantepec, this strong matriarchal figure uh, who dominated the economy on, on the isthmus um, and uh, that I'll be talking about as we move on. This later painting, by the way, was commissioned by Kahlo's dentist, Samuel Fastlicht, who paid 2,500 Mexican pesos at the time for it, which was about $500 US. And that gives us a sense of what Kahlo was selling her paintings for at the time. Uh, that actually included um, $100 that went towards an outstanding dental bill, by the way. Interesting too, is that the self-portrait as a Tawana of 1948 was the only painting that Kahlo finished that year. Uh, and it reminds us that as the 40s moved along, Kahlo's um, output really declined uh, and she was producing less and less, particularly um, uh, as, 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 as she got sicker towards, towards the end of the 50s and into the early 1950s. And this painting though still captures that precise brushwork, the tight little brush strokes using tiny brushes that really distinguishes her best work like, like the painting I've been talking about. Now I'd like to turn from analysis of the painting and especially any readings of the work that would connect it to her fraught but intense relationship with Diego Rivera to the issue of Kahlo's cult, what I call cross-cultural cross-dressing. Her frequent appearance in front of the public, whether on the streets or, or attending an, an event or even posing at home for the photographer whose photographs she well understood were gonna be widely seen, um, wearing the costume of the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. And I mean, cross-cultural cross-dressing because this is not a gendered cross-dressing, but rather wearing the culture of another person. Yes, Frida Kahlo is Mexican, but she is not herself a Tawana, nor it, does she have any direct uh, connection uh, perhaps to the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. 
In both of these photographs, including one by Florence Arquin, the um, American uh, journalist on the left-hand side, uh, you can see Kahlo posing actually right after completing the Gelman painting. Uh, there it is again in its original frame. But uh, in that photograph, Kahlo is wearing a much simpler wipil. It's more of a blouse with embroidery done by a sewing machine and a skirt of a non-matching color. This is very typical in Tehuantepec that women don't match the wipil to the skirt. Uh, in, the, in a slightly later photograph by Nicholas Morai taken in New York, Kahlo wears another wipil again decorated with embroidery done by a sewing machine and a skirt here with the uh, with a lace uh, attachment at the bottom. Kahlo uh, acquired these garments, some of them directly from Tehuantepec through intermediaries, perhaps Diego Rivera um, got, helped her get them uh, or dealers in Mexico City. Um, but sometimes she manufactured the skirts herself. And the skirt on the left side, that purple skirt is not typical of Tehuantepec. That's probably a skirt that she herself had made in Mexico City. Um, there were, these were among many, what we might call ethnic or anth uh, anthropological costumes that Kahlo owned and that have been studied in depth, particularly by Marta Turok. Um, who found that Kahlo blended both authentic and inauthentic costumes, things that were purchased from communities, things that were made in Mexico City to imitate costumes produced in indigenous communities, and then uh, uh, costumes of her, own, uh, of her own invention, including sometimes European uh, or Western clothes, uh, and even Chinese things as well. So Kahlo was mixing and matching uh, both locally produced and Mexico City produced garments. This theatrical use of traditional Mexican costumes for her was multifaceted. Um, and although these costumes were read by many and are still read by many as indigenous or nationalist Mexican or even anti-modern, uh, they were actually part of what I would say was a very modern wardrobe. She mixed and matched parts and fabrics and even cultures. Uh, for example, in the photograph on the right, taken in 1952, uh, and sadly here you can see she looks far older than 45 years, um, Kahlo combines a long uh, embroidered coat, a cloth coat from Guatemala, with a Mazatec we peel from Jalapa de Diaz, a town in Oaxaca. And, and this combination of garments from different places, different cultures, including things that she herself has commissioned, I think really resemble more the modern closet, uh, the modern closet of a, of a contemporary woman than the conservative mores of traditional indigenous society where women only wear one particular costume associated with their community. Uh, and uh, are, are completely tied to that. So we can, I think we need to see Kahlo's costumes as very modern, even if she's using sort of traditionally made or anti-modern, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, costumes associated more with a traditional, traditional life. Now, if we turn back to the 1920s, to the mid 1920s, when Kahlo began her career as a painter, we see already that she was very concerned with fashion, but, in represent, representing herself as a modern woman and really almost as a flapper, I think. Um, she was very engaged with other images of modern women. She dressed very stylishly. Often people focus on the fact that she once appeared wearing a man's suit in, in a famous family photograph, but Kahlo generally was much more interested in dressing like a modern woman. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the painting. I just wanna point out the photograph on the right, which is by her father. She wears a silk dress that actually has Chinese embroidery. And I think might've been either, maybe perhaps made by her mother or something that, uh, that certainly that she acquired in Mexico City. Um, now, the self-portrait of 1926, which is Kahlo's first self-portrait, um, is sometimes called self-portrait in a red velvet dress. 
And that reminds all of us that no, we can never take these titles at face value. This idea that this was a red velvet dress was applied long after Kahlo's death, um, uh, perhaps by Gomisarius, who, who her, her, her boyfriend her, uh, of the mid 1920s, who she painted this picture for. Um, it's not actually a red velvet dress. It's actually a bathrobe. And you can see it's a, it could be maybe a velvety bathrobe, but it has a very wide, um, maybe an embroidered collar, or perhaps that's something of some sort of a, a textile itself, uh, wide lapels that come down very, very low cut. And it's not really that the dress is low cut, it's that it's a bathrobe and it's just loose there at the chest. Um, and if you look carefully, you can see Kahlo's naked under this bathrobe. And I think here, Kahlo is imitating purposefully uh, a series of photographs taken by Edward Weston of his uh, mentor uh, and lover, the photographer Tina Madotti, who was wearing a kimono in a, one particular photo shoot uh, from 1924, a kimono that they had brought with them from California. And of course the kimono, like the bathrobe is something that a woman can wear associated with leisure, with um, relaxation, even with the bedroom. Both of these garments are garments that can be worn over the naked body and easily opened up um, by, by the, probably the man. So I think that uh, the self-portrait in, 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 uh, of 1926 is really about showing herself as sexually available. And that is, was extremely modern for a woman to do in the mid-1920s, particularly for a bourgeois Mexican woman to show herself in this modern way with short hair, free, independent, uh, not confined to the social mores uh, of, of, of Mexico City. And I think this 1926 portrait you know, shows that right from the very beginning, Kahlo understood the power of costume to signify something. Now, the first appearance of the Tawana costume, this of the simple kind of everyday Tawana costume with this short red we peel or blouse, again, that's been embroidered by a sewing machine and the long skirt with its lace trim at the bottom, which is known as an inagua. Um, the first appearance of that costume in Kahlo's work actually um, is 1933 in a very complicated painting, uh, a, a sort of mural-like collage of uh, popular and uh, modern industrial urban culture in New York City uh, in, in the early years of the depression. Um, and Kahlo's dress is the sole Mexican object that sort of floats, hangs in the center of the picture, surrounded by this complex um, and critical vision of modern of the modern United States. But it's disembodied. Kahlo's not in the dress. The dress is just kind of hanging there as if Mexico is hanging there, but Kahlo isn't really present. The dress also appears, again, almost disembodied, although Kahlo's arm is in it. Uh, in, the, in a 1937 painting, a smaller a painting from 1937 called Memory, sometimes referred to as the heart, where she's dressed in a very modern costume. She has on a uh, cap, uh, capskin jacket and a you know, completely modern dress for 1937. Her schoolgirl uniform sort of floats off in the distance. So that's the past, the memory of the past. And then the Tawana dress embraces her or the Sort of, but again, Kahlo's disembodied from these dresses. And I think these are the, this is the first appearance of the dress in Kahlo's, Kahlo's work. It's gonna be about just towards the end of 1937 that she creates this triptych really of paintings wearing the everyday with peel and skirt from Tehuantepec. And uh, we know these works are all from 1937. We don't have specific dates for them. It's very hard to plug Kahlo's work you know, month by month, but we do know that the self-portrait dedicated to Leon Trotsky on the left side, which is now in the National Museum of Women in the Arts in Washington, DC, was painted in November of 1937. So I think all three of these pictures are actually from the end of 1937. 
And this is where Kahlo first begins to appear in a Tawana dress. And it's probably around this time, this is almost eight years after her marriage to Diego Rivera, that she's actually wearing the dress of Tuanchepec. We have very few photograph, very little photographic evidence that Frida Kahlo was wearing the dress from Tuanchepec uh, much before uh, the late 1930s. Um, let me just see if my, um, I think sometimes these long dresses, which Kahlo began to wear soon after her marriage to Rivera, uh, more peasant type dresses, were said to be worn to conceal her damaged leg. She, she'd had polio as a young girl. And of course she'd had the, the terrible accident uh, in 1925. And so sometimes people argue that this dress was, was really about concealing uh, her, her, her leg or that it was the dress that Diego Rivera wanted her to wear. But again, my argument is Kahlo isn't using this dress into well into their marriage. So this is not something that she begins to wear right after her marriage to Rivera in 1929. I think for her, this dress was fundamentally an assertion of a, a strong sense of national identity, perhaps associated with the Isthmus of Tehuantepec and the Tehuanas there, but I think she's actually using it more as, as a symbol of a more general mestizaje or blended culture, because this dress is worn by indigenous women in Oaxaca, but the long skirt with that lace fringe is completely Victorian. That, is, that comes at the end of the 19th century. The wipil is embroidered in, in geometric designs, but it's using modern Singer sewing machines as early as perhaps 1900, Singer sewing machines are being imported into the Isthmus of Tuantepec. So the dress is not in some way, some pure indigenous costume look that you can locate in some uh, distant past. If anything in Tuantepec, you'd want to, if you were gonna talk about indigenous culture, you'd wanna, the women would be wearing that tight purplish blue skirt, not this loose Victorian skirt. So I think Kahlo really sees it as, a, as an emblem of, of mestizaje or, or the sort of blending of indigenous and, uh, and uh, European culture, um, as well as a, a sort of a national dress. And that's partly because by the time she even comes on the scene, Diego Rivera and others had already established the Isthmus of Tehuantepec and particularly the costume of the Tijuana as one of the icons of Mexican national identity. This is Diego Rivera's uh, fresco panel, the Sandunga, which is a traditional dance of 1924, which is in his famous fresco cycle in the Ministry of Public Education in Mexico City. And Rivera's own interest in Tehuantepec dates from late 1922, December 1922, when he traveled to the Isthmus by train accompanied by his then wife, Guadalupe Marine. Um, and I think one of the reasons, by the way, that Frida Kahlo never went to, the, to Tuantepec was it was a grueling, long train ride to get there. Um, it, was, it wasn't ever easy to travel there uh, until well after World War II. Um, Rivera returned uh, to, to, from Tuantepec armed with sketches and would create this mural and other murals and paintings focused on, on Tuantepec. His friend, the artist Jean Charlot, later recalled that Rivera had returned from Tuantepec shaken into simplicity, um, recounting to everybody who had listened tall tales of a matriarchal society where Amazonian women lord it over wizened men. And in fact, Rivera's sort of fantastic mythological Myth mythologizing image of Tehuantepec as a place where women controlled everything and it was the only great matriarchal culture in Mexico. This is what people often believed, uh, generally believed in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, although anthropologists have gone and, and shown that much of this was a sort of outsider create, uh, invention, that, that yes, women do control the economy in some ways in Tehuantepec, but they also control the economy in many villages across Mexico and that Tehuantepec is not particularly more matriarchal 
than other regions uh, of, of the country. So this was something that was a little bit exaggerated going back into the 19th century. In fact, Rivera's idealization of the Tuana uh, as a figure and Tuantepec in general, again, this southern part of the country, this distant place, myth, myth, uh, uh, kind of almost mythical place, is part of a broader cultural phenomenon that he was certainly familiar with in which women from all sorts of Southern locales, Andalusia, if you think of the opera Carmen, or Algeria in the paintings by Delacroix, Tahiti in the work of Gauguin, or the Mediterranean coast in the work of Picasso. And Rivera was familiar with all of that practice. In all of those uh, images, these Southern women, these tropical women, distant women, were recast and objectified by European artists, writers, and intellectuals, almost invariably men. For Rivera, however, this was really more than just an escapist fantasy. His images of Tuantepec served a nationalist project that transformed the Tawana from a local type, somebody specific to, to this region, into a, a kind of a, a, a more broader uh, and, and uh, broader symbol of Mexican identity, of national identity. And that's the purpose of including them in his murals in the Ministry of Public Education. And this is taking place in the 1920s and 30s where regional culture in Mexico is being converted into national culture. And the most famous example of this is the mariachi, which today everybody thinks is completely associated with Mexico and mariachis are Mexican. But in the 1920s and 30s, mariachis were associated exclusively with Guadalajara and, and or the state of Jalisco. And you would not have heard mariachis really in Mexico City. It's radio that is going to convert the mariachi into a national, uh, into a kind of a national musical type. Um, and that's a process that's taking place in the post-revolutionary period. Indeed, um, around the time that Rivera and Kahlo married, Rivera had painted not one, but two portraits of a woman uh, um, wearing the face appeal of Tuantepec. Uh, and this woman, is, her name is Aurea Procel. She was an educator and a doctor. She was um, one of the first feminists in Mexico. She's one of these heroic women in the post-revolutionary period that we don't hear so much about because she was uh, more, uh, you know, engaged in practice, being a doctor and a lecturer, rather than uh, a, a kind of a cultural hero. In fact, in 1929, Aurea Procel organized a huge festival in the National Stadium in Mexico City, where hundreds of women dressed up in this costume of Tuantepec and did a giant nationalist pageant. So uh, Rivera paints her in this costume and Aurea Procel was actually from Tuantepec. So this, this is a woman wearing a costume associated with her own culture. Um, and nobody's really made a comparison between Kahlo's 1943 painting and Rivera's 1929 painting, which was in a Mexican uh, uh, co collection um, early, it, then it left, it, it's now in the United States, it's been in the United States for many years in a private collection. It's never been publicly shown. We're actually including it in the Diego Rivera show at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. And what I find very interesting in this comparison uh, is you really see how for Rivera, first of all, you know, he's kind of, he's fascinated with this, the, 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 the face of Aurea Procel is, is almost, looks like it's taken from a, um, magazine advertisement for Revlon or something with her lipstick and her bright blue eyes. Um, but Rivera is really kind of very carefully showing you that the, what the costume is. He includes that false sleeve in the front uh, and the, the resplendor around the face. But Rivera really, it's very brushy and he's not interested in any way in this almost um, obsessive uh, depiction of detail that, that Kahlo is. But Kahlo didn't have to go to the Ministry of Education to see Diego Rivera's murals. She didn't have to know of women like Aurea Procel, 
who are wearing this costume in these 1929 portraits, all Kahlo had to do was reach into her pocketbook. Because in 1943, the Mexican 10 peso bill had an image of a Tijuana on it. Um, this, uh, th this money was actually uh, designed, uh, first issued in 1937, um, and it lasted actually for three decades. So everybody had Tijuanas in their pockets um, at this time. And in fact, what's interesting is there's nothing more national than currency for the modern nation state. And this selection of the image of the Tijuana is said to have been promoted by the Mexican president, Lázaro Cárdenas, who wanted to update the Mexican currency of the 1920s, which had much less nationalistic imagery. And in fact, it, I think the 10 peso bill actually had a, a picture of a woman that looked like she could have been in Spain or Europe or something like that. And so Cardenas wanted to update the currency with these more nationalist images. And it was the Tijuana of all possibilities that was chosen for, for this bill. And it's, it's not only any old Tijuana, it's the Tijuana wearing this face wepeel or this ceremonial wepeel of lace uh, that, you see, that you see here. The, the woman wearing the wepeel is actually um, a woman named Maria Stela Ruiz. They, people actually figure, you know, know about her. She won a costume pageant in 1936. She lived well into like, to, I don't know, into the like 2000. And uh, she always complained in interviews that she'd never been paid anything to, to appear on the Mexican currency. Now, beyond Rivera, um, and the general interest in Tehuantepec. And beyond um, the um, fact that the Tijuana appeared on the Mexican, in Mexican currency, some scholars have come to believe that perhaps Frida Kahlo had a specific connection to Oaxaca through her mother. In 2004, this photograph was discovered in the archive in the Frida Kahlo house in Mexico City which had been sealed away again for five decades, a photograph that was not available to any of Kahlo's biographers, including Hayden Herrera. This photograph seemed to indicate that Kahlo had family connections to the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. And in fact, Hayden Herrera in her 1983 biography wrote that Kahlo's mother, Matilda Calderon was from Oaxaca. And the photograph oops, sorry, which is annotated by Frida Kahlo, indicates that this girl in the front on the left is her mama. And she's actually written here in ballpoint pen, Mama Oaxaca, in parentheses, Matilde Calderon, nine years old, 1890. And then she goes down below to say, this is her mother. She now has uh, four daughters. Is this Frida Kahlo's mother? Kahlo has annotated the photograph saying it's her mother, but there's some questions here. Um, Frida Kahlo's mother was actually born and baptized in Mexico City in 1874. Um, and so she would have been nine in 1883, but there are some stylistic reasons both the way the photograph has been printed, the type of photograph, and the dress that these women are wearing in Western clothes indicate, I think, that this photograph might be quite a bit later than 1883, perhaps 1890, like Kahlo's inscription says, or even as late as 1900. I don't have a definitive answer here. If there's somebody in the audience that has studied this photograph, I'll be very interested in, in talking to them. But I don't think we can take at face value or even take Kahlo's words here, uh, literally, that this is in fact her mother or that this is her mother in the state of Oaxaca and not her mother dressed up as a Tijuana in Mexico City. Remember, the front cover of that modern Mexico magazine showed Tijuanas in 1899 as, as, as this kind of popular interest in Tijuana. So what is this photograph? Who are the other people in this photograph? Why are some women in very elite, you know, European dress and others wearing Tawana costumes. 
why are some men in suits? And why is this man in the background in a sort of more peasant costume with a scarf around his neck? The, the context of this photograph it remains really a mystery. And Kahlo, who is somebody that was constantly theatrically, dramatically inventing her life. She, as many of you know, changed the date of her birth from 1907 to 1910 to have it coincide with the onset of the Mexican Revolution, might be here in ballpoint pen, annotating a photograph after she herself has already begun using a Tawana costume and trying to create a history for herself. It's really a big, a big question. It might be your mother, but again, it might not. I think rather than trying to tie Kahlo's Tijuana costume solely to Rivera or to, uh, or to a family history, I think we need to see it as part of a long-standing phenomenon in which elite intellectual women or, or, or powerful women uh, in urban areas, in, in Europe and uh, in the United States, dressed up in the costume of distant cultures, uh, and particularly uh, cu cultures that they, they felt were exotic places of greater freedom, greater uh, freedom, particularly for women. Whether those cultures were more free for women is, is, is a, another subject altogether. Uh, and, and two examples, I'm showing you a painting, um, a French painting from the middle of the 18th century of Madame de Pompadour dressed as a Turkish lady. Uh, to underscore this, she's actually drinking coffee and has a, uh, an African servant. This is a very theatrical presentation of herself in, in a sort of leisurely sitting almost on the floor, uh, unlike a proper in, uh, French woman of the day. Or a century later, uh, more than a century later, Claude Monet's famous um, uh, portrait of, of his wife, La Japonaise, uh, where she's wearing uh, a man's ceremonial kimono uh, and carrying a Japanese fan. And, um, and actually, uh, Monet's wife is wearing a blonde wig to exaggerate her Europeanness in contrast to the extremely Japanese. Uh, or Asian costume that she wears. The, the phenomenon of dressing as a Turk was known as Turkeri. The phenomenon of, uh, that Monet is practicing here is known in French as Japanese. And we could think of Tawantepequisme or Tawantepequeri as something that was being used in the 1920s and 30s in Mexico uh, in a way like these uh, women. Now, of course, for Frida Kahlo, Tawantepec, is closer than Japan was for Monet or Turkey was for Madame de Pompadour. Um, and it's in fact part of the same country. It's not another place, but uh, we could still see it as this distant place that is peripheral to the metropolis, to Mexico City. And that is in some ways a place of the extraction of raw materials uh, of you know, uh, uh, or, or trade routes that are being used by the Mexico City at, for its own power. So even though it, 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 there's a difference in intensity, there's not completely a difference uh, in kind in terms of the relationship between Mexico City and this distant place. But yes, there's a difference because it is part, all part of the same country. I think though this is maybe the more fruitful area to explore. And the first example of this in Mexico City was uh, Saturnino Iran's 1914 painting, Tijuana, which shows his own wife, Rosario Arellano, um, uh, who he had married that year wearing the costume of a Tijuana. And this is a painting that uh, Kahlo might have been uh, familiar with. Rivera, I think, was certainly familiar with this, with this picture. This was a very radical portrait uh, of its time. Uh, for Iran and perhaps for his wife, it was an assertion of a new form of national identity based on the indigenous and the local. And it's probably the first example of this cross-cultural cross-dressing in Mexico outside of theater or vaudeville. I'm not even sure how common it was there. Certainly the first example of a sort of elite 
Mexico City woman wearing a costume associated with rural Mexico. This would not have been possible in Mexico in the 19th century. Uh, and it, it's an urban woman who's wearing a costume that was in some ways associated with the working class and indigenous culture, even with the elite ceremonial side of things. Um, but the revolution was underway in 1914, the Mexican revolution, and the old order was being undermined. The old rules were being broken. And I think that's why uh, both Iran and his wife, who after all is the one appearing in this costume, felt empowered. But what's very interesting to me is something that I have finally been able to return to after almost really 30 years. Um, in 1990, this painting was included in Mexico, Splendors of 30 Centuries, a major exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, later traveled to, to Texas and California. And I was going through the show with an, a woman, a, she's now deceased, named Dorothy Leadbetter. Um, and I didn't know anything about Tehuantepec at that time at all. And she pointed out to me that this, this costume has just been draped around the woman. It's not being worn in any way correctly. If you look at the photograph on the cover of Modern Mexico, you see that it has to be, it can be draped around the head and then it has to flow back behind the back so that the chest is, is exposed. But basically Iran is just kind, he has no idea how it's meant to be worn. And so he's just draped it around his wife in a misunderstanding of a distant culture. And we see that, of course, in European painting, and we see it, we see it here. By the time Frida Kahlo adopted uh, the Tawana costume, many other women in Mexico had already been doing so, particularly adopting different forms of local dress to assert national identity. And this was especially being done by women whose identity as Mexican was easily challenged. I think perhaps the first example of this was Alma Reed, the American journalist, the lover of the socialist governor of Yucatan, Felipe Carrillo Puerto, who uh, around 1923 transformed herself, an American journalist, into a Mexican or more specifically a Yucateca by adopting the embroidered dress of local women, which is actually also known as a wipil there to at once differentiate herself from the elite women, the wealthy women of Merida. There they are in a, a photograph from 1913 on the right side, these, these, what they call the casta divina, the divine caste of Merida. So she's, she's distancing herself from those rich women because she's attached to a man who's a socialist, but she's also ameliorating her national difference and to reduce any tensions that might've been caused by her romantic affiliation with this leading politician. This then became widespread ac across the 1920s, long before Frida Kahlo ever adopted a, a costume of this type. In each of these cases, uh, Rosa Rolando, the, um, to be later the wife of the painter Miguel Covarrubias, a Mexican American woman from Los Angeles, uh, here in a photo, shirt, photo shoot um, uh, with Edward Weston, dressed in the Tawana costume, um, very theatrically posing. Um, she's not, she was Mexican American, but she wasn't actually uh, from uh, Mexico City, obviously. Uh, David Alfaro Siqueiros, a portrait of his wife, uh, Blanca Luz Broom, who was an Uruguayan poet. But in 1931, Siqueiros shows Blanca Luz as a, with a hairstyle, the braided hairstyle of a Mexican woman and these thick jade beads associated with the countryside as well. Or in more quirky painting uh, that Helga Prignitz Poda discovered, uh, Christian Schad, a painting done in Berlin called Mexican Girl, which is of uh, a woman we don't really know very much about, but certainly indicated by her name, Ponce de Leon from the upper class dressed uh, as a Chino Poblana. So all of these women, white women, associated are, are kind of Mexicanizing themselves through costume well before Frida. Well, to conclude, I just wanna say that Kahlo's use of the Tawana costume 
not only was influenced by these predecessors, but then I think influences profoundly other women of her day. The most important was certainly Olga Tamayo, the, uh, married to one of Mexico's most famous painters, Rufino Tamayo. Uh, Olga was from Mexico City, but she adopted the Tijuana costume and appears uh, both in paintings by Tamayo and in photographs wearing that costume, um, perhaps to associate herself with Tamayo, who himself was Oaxacan, although not from the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. I think she inspired Olga to be the wife playing the Tawana, just as Frida Kahlo had, had been the, the, the wife of a famous painter dressed as a Tawana. But we find Tawanas all over the place in the 50s, they're a dime a dozen, um, and it had almost become a cliche. Movie stars like Columba Dominguez, painted by Diego Rivera in 1950, now wearing that tight skirt, making her a little sexier, I think. Um, uh, Dolores Olmedo, Rivera's major uh, patron, um, uh, dressed as a Tijuana in 1955. Her mother was in fact from Oaxaca. Or Maria Felix, uh, the movie, another movie star wearing the costume of the Tijuana. And again, here with that resplandor, that, that ceremonial we peel uh, in the 1957 movie uh, um, Tisoc. And finally, I wanna say that perhaps the most direct inspiration is the Japanese artist Yasumasa Morimura, who did a, is very well known for an extended series of self-portrait photographs uh, that he took uh, in which he channels different paintings by Frida Kahlo. And in this one, an inner dialogue with Frida Kahlo from 2001, you can see that in the studio, he has really tried to replicate that costume. Now, not in any way photographically, but more through uh, these sort of, you know, flowers and branches and textiles that he's been able to assemble to create his own resplandor, his own energy field surrounding Kahlo's head um, and showing that this Tawana dress uh, now is uh, inspiring artists as far away as Japan. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I would be happy to take questions and um, look forward to that. Great, thank you so much, James, for that kind of journey into identity and costuming through um, one iconic uh, self-portrait by Frida Kahlo. Um, I, there are a few questions in the chat that I'd like to go ahead and address. We don't have a lot of time, but I'm gonna uh, take a few of these in here. Um, let's see. Uh, these are more comments right here. Give me a second. Ah. In the photograph of Kahlo's mother as a child, might the use of Western dress be attributable to an exogenous marriage? I'm not sure if I, that is, would women in Western jet dress have married into the indigenous line? Well, that's a good question. And I think I, that might be a good avenue to, to explore. Um, I, 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 I haven't had the opportunity to really, you know, one thing I need to do is to study the photograph itself physically, because I think to, I, I really want to just get a, an idea of the date of the photograph and I can be able to tell that through the paper and the mount and I'm gonna to have to wait to, to see the photograph when I can get back into the archive at the Frida Kahlo Museum. But yeah, it, it, it's, it's unclear. Are these people all from the same family? Is this, who are those husbands with their wives? I think all of that needs to be teased out um, if we ever can. It might be that the, the identities of a lot of those figures remain, um, remain vague or unknown. But that, that's, a, that's a good observation that I'd have to do some studying then on, on about intermarriage and the way families mingled in that way between sort of the urban Western and the local. But yeah. There's just many, many possibilities there. So another question is about the Badani uh, worn in the painting. Um, mm -hmm. This person had heard that they are derived from colonial nun habits. So um, 
they're referencing the triangular format of the garment as well as the flowers in her hair. Um, what do you think about this? Uh, yes, they, they do look like the way that um, virgins are off, the statues of virgins are often dressed with a, a sort of a lacy shawl and then it comes down often particularly particular types of virgins that take on a very triangular format. The thing is that that sleeve, that disembodied, that strange sleeve that just pops on the diagonal in the front is not something you'd, you'd necessarily see. And it's also unclear why would an indigenous, how would an indigenous woman get her hands on this costume maybe that's designed for the Virgin Mary and then wear it? Or are they trying to imitate images of the Virgin Mary? That's a, a, one of the theories that floats around this garment. Um, there, are, there are several of these theories, um, all of which are really fascinating, but none of them are in any way definitive, I, I would just say. Um, but certainly if I'd gone into more detail, I probably should have mentioned, yes, indeed, this triangular virgin format that maybe women in Tehuantepec are trying to imitate. Although it's, it, it's more obvious in Kahlo's painting than it is in sometimes in the actual photographs of where, women wearing it. But that's a good observation. Thank you. So this question is, how deliberate was Kahlo in drawing formal associations with post-impressionists and modern painters of the late 19th and early 20th century? Did she aim to cultivate modern and or, and or anti-modern anti dialogues through her artwork in relationship to theirs? Well, that's a good, that's a, that's a title for an, that's a subject for a whole essay. Um, I would say that the short answer here is that Kahlo was far more well-read than we maybe some people want to give her credit for. Uh, the emphasis on Kahlo's paintings being connected to her biography, I think, has sometimes made us forget how uh, well-informed she was in terms of, you know, awareness of the history of art, and of course, many other uh, reading in many other areas and conversations with Diego Rivera, who knew all of this long, deep tradition of uh, the interest of, you know, fr by French artists, particularly in these distant locales as a way of energizing modern culture or creating an anti-modern uh, response to modernity, industrialization, and all of that. So, um, you know, Kahlo never really wrote about uh, her own practice in, in comparison to painters, let's say like Gauguin, you know? And of course she's a woman adopting a costume which is very different from a man representing a woman in a costume. So there's a very different dynamic there. But, um, you know, I think, you know, Kahlo was very cognizant of all these decisions and they were all very conscious. They weren't in any way accidental. Um, and I think it's, it's difficult sometimes um, to actually kind of go against the received wisdom that we have about her adopting these costumes because it was the, the Diego Rivera, you know, the, the calo that Diego Rivera loved or the skirt that hid her wounded leg or these stories that in fact are often connected to Kahlo might only be part of a more complicated story, I guess is what I want to say, in which Kahlo is engaging with these other particularly European traditions um, consciously or, or not. Um, the fact of the matter is that Kahlo is not a Tawana and she is dressing up as a Tawana to make a statement. In her case, perhaps more of a political statement than in the case of somebody like Madame de Pompadour, who, who is, you know, trapped in French colonial policies or whatever. But, um, but that, that this is a fruitful way. I think the only way we can really explore Kahlo in new and interesting ways is to get away from the biography and to get away from, from uh, her fraught relationship with Diego Rivera because that has really been worked to death. And so the only fresh ideas I think that are gonna come out in Kahlo studies are through trying to look at her in a broader history of art um, and broader cultural phenomena, which is what I'm trying to do, trying to do here, I guess. I think that's a great place to end. Um, so thank you so much for today's presentation and thank all of our 
our, our virtual visitors uh, to this program. Uh, we very much enjoyed it. Uh, I just want to put a plug in. Our next program uh, is um, with a local filmmaker who uh, did a documentary on uh, Diego Rivera, and that will be on March uh, 31st. Um, you can check that out on our website. So thank you all for being here today, and you all have a good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. Bye.